Local 4 News starts now with a breaking news alert. That breaking news with live pictures now from Sky 4 over the Huron River in Wixom, where officials are warning people to stay out of the water due to a chemical spill. Off the top at 5, the warning from the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy was issued late this afternoon. That's right, and it clearly states people should not swim, wade in, play, or drink any water directly from the Huron River between Wixom Road in Oakland County to Kensington Road in Livingston County. Jason Colthorpe is live in the newsroom with more on this story for us tonight, Jason. Yeah, a lot of people affected here, Kim, and the state is also stressing there is no threat to drinking water at this time. Now, testing and monitoring is underway by both the State Departments of Health and Human Services and Eagle. Now, according to the state, this is what happened. Monday, Tribar Manufacturing in Wixom reported it released several thousand gallons of liquid containing 5% hexavalent chrom chromium to the Wixom Sewage Treatment Facility. That facility discharges into the Huron River. Hexavalent chromium is a known carcinogen that can cause several health problems if it's ingested or even comes in contact with skin. Now, MDHHS is recommending all people and pets avoid contact with the Huron River water between North Wixom Road in Oakland County and Kensington Road in Livingston County. I have a map here that you can see gives you a, a, a kind of a bird's eye view of what we're talking about because this also includes Norton Creek, Hubble Pond, which some people know as Mill Pond, and Kent Lake. And as you guys mentioned, don't swim in or drink any water in these areas. Don't even water your plants or your lawn with this water or eat any fish that was caught out of that water. Now, the company reported the release on Monday, but it may have started Saturday, and it's believed to have already made its way through the wastewater plant by the time that that was noticed. Uh, Eagle is already out in the field doing testing at the plant and those waterways, but it is calling this release of hexavalent chromium significant. Kim, Devin, back to you. We'll bear watching. We will continue to follow and update it just as soon as we can. Our other top story at five, a two-year-old Detroit girl in the hospital after she was shot while sitting in a car with her dad. Just awful story here. It happened this morning on Witt Street. That's not far from Fort Street and Lawndale with a 55-year-old man also getting hit with a stray bullet. Megan Woods is live on this story tonight. Uh, Megan, that little girl, how's she doing? The good news is that little girl is now in stable condition. That 55 year old man, another innocent bystander, is still in serious condition as of what we know right now. Now, police say it happened right here. It started here on Lawndale and Witt. But then the shooter doesn't stop there. They say that he, as he was fleeing the scene, he drives down Witt, and that's when that 55 year old was shot. If it wasn't for neighbors, I don't know. Mary Wynn gets emotional thinking about what happened to her son, Calvin, just a few feet away from their home. He didn't do nothing. You know, he was an innocent bystander underneath his car working on it and for this to happen. So what do you say? He had a back brace on and it went through his, got the, his back brace, got a hole like this. Detroit police say the shooting started at this intersection. A vehicle with a father, his two year old daughter and two other adults were driving on Lawndale when suddenly someone begins shooting at them. There was uh, what we believe to be a silver or gray Jeep uh, that pulled alongside the vehicle. Uh, occupants of that car fired several shots into the uh, vehicle containing the child. As the Jeep drives off, the shooter inside fires more shots down Witt Street, hitting Mary Wynn's son. This comes less than 24 hours after Detroit Police Chief James White spoke about the city's violent weekend with 24 non-fatal shootings and seven homicides. If you're willing to fire, fire a bunch of rounds in the middle of a neighborhood at 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, you don't care. Police say it appears the shots were only fired from that silver or gray Jeep. But again, this is all still under investigation. They are still trying to figure out what really happened here. And we will have those updates on air and on clickondetroit.com. Live in Detroit, I'm Megan Woods, Local 4. Okay, Megan, thanks. Now to a big night for Michigan politics. Yeah, as we speak, voters are casting ballots to decide multiple primary races for both governor and a host of hotly contested House seats. We've got the GOP race for governor, which already saw a major shakeup after the top two contenders 
were booted off the ballot. Redistricting, of course, has thrown several House races up in the air with incumbents running against each other. We're going to break down those in a few minutes. You have a little less than three hours to get to the polls to vote tonight. Mara McDonald following the GOP primary for governor. One of the big races we'll be watching. She's live at the Amway Grand Plaza in Grand Rapids, where the Tudor Dixon campaign is holding their election night party. We'll get to her in a moment. But we want to start with Hank Winchester. He's live tonight at the Douglas Library on Detroit's west side, where people continue to cast their ballots there. Hank, has it been going pretty smoothly so far today? Kimberly, Devin, I'll tell you what, we've been all over Metro Detroit, from the city to the suburbs, and it has been a very smooth process. Take a look. As you mentioned, the polls open this morning. They're open till 8 o'clock. Not going to lie, it's been very slow here within the last hour or so. But more than a million Michiganders voted absentee. And as far as today goes, the Secretary of State says that today, things have gone just as planned. Here on Detroit's west side, a slow but fairly steady stream of people making their way into this polling location to make sure their voice is heard. If we don't start grassroots, then by the time it does get to the Capitol, our vote won't be any good if we don't make sure our vote counts. Our Help Me Hank cameras have been all over today, from the city to the suburbs, checking on any potential problems. The good news? Today has been almost problem-free, according to Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. We've seen uh, smoothness at the polling places throughout the day throughout Michigan, although we do have people all throughout the state representing my office on, on site to ensure if anything does happen, we're there to respond to it quickly. The concern, Benson says, today is not the problems that we've seen in the past with machines that have been malfunctioning or low volunteer turnout. Today, the concern is about misinformation. We've seen a lot of enthusiasm from people on both sides of the aisle wanting to be a part of the process, which is a great thing. But we've seen a number of people who have been fed misinformation and, and misunderstandings of the elections process uh, in some ways activated to potentially interfere with the process. And we're talking about misinformation being spread on the Internet, also cases of misinformation at different polling locations, although we have not seen that today. Uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, we're talking with Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel about the penalties for those who are, in fact, spreading misinformation. Also, we want to hear from you. If you experience any problems this evening uh, trying to get out there and vote, we want to work to correct those problems. We are in touch with county clerks throughout the evening, also the Secretary of State, to make sure that your voice is heard. And remember, you have until 8 o'clock tonight to vote. We're live here tonight on the west side. Hank Winchester, help me, Hank, Local 4. All right, Hank. Statewide now, the key race, of course, is the GOP gubernatorial primary, which saw a last-minute endorsement come through from former President Donald Trump. Our Mar McDonald is live tonight. Mar, we, we head into this evening with the two original top polling candidates nowhere on the ballot. It's been really interesting. Kimberly, it has been interesting, and you know, the, the candidates who are on the ballot suffer from a lack of name ID, and currently, really, only Tudor Dixon and Kevin Rinke are up in heavy rotation on the airwaves in the metro. The final slate of GOP gubernatorial candidates has GOP primary voters choosing between Tudor Dixon, Ryan Kelly, Ralph Reband, Kevin Rinke, and Garrett Soldano. But it's Dixon and Rinke who have the money and the endorsements. Dixon, late Friday night, was endorsed by former President Trump. She's also got the backing of GOP mega donors, the DeVos family. Rinke's got better name ID on this side of the state, though, because of his family's long-standing auto business, and he can self-fund. Bottom line, we're about to see how much a Donald Trump endorsement means in a Michigan GOP primary. Back here live, something to consider. You know, polling suggests that GOP primary voters, uh, a plurality of them, want to vote in person at the polls. Well, I live in a very heavily red area. I was voter number 111 when I hit the polls after noon today. So... Let's see what happens to those numbers as the after work crowd starts filtering in. But if they do have a strong absentee turnout in GOP primary voters, that may change the math here simply because Trump's endorsement came really at the 11th hour. We're live in Grand Rapids tonight. I'm Mara McDonald, Local 4. We'll be getting back yeah. to Mara frequently here uh, as we take you through election night. The race for governor, though, not the only thing that we're watching, of course. There's also the hotly contested 13th district with Shriek Tanadar going up against Adam Ollier and a host of other big names. 
There's also the battle of the incumbents in the 11th Congressional District. No doubt you've seen a few ads for this mm -hmm. one. Haley Stevens going up against Andy Levin. Yeah, and we're going to be constantly updating the results as they come in. To click on Detroit.com, you can find links to all the races across the state right there on the home page. And be sure to join me tonight starting at 8 on Local 4 Plus. I'll be joined by our pollster, uh, Richard Juba, and uh, other election experts to break down the results in real time as they come in. So join us tonight at 8 p.m. We'll get underway on Local 4 Plus. Now to the weather and things uh, set to heat up as we make our way through the middle of the week. Yeah, let's uh, the threat of storms too coming along with that. Let's get over to Brett Collar for an update, Brett. It's going to be a busy day tomorrow as we are expecting, like you said, some very hot and muggy air around on top of that showers and storms expected. Those storms are likely going to be strongest later in the afternoon into the evening hours. And again, severe weather is a possibility. Strong damaging winds is going to be the biggest concern. But you see it there, a high of 96. That's not it though. You factor in the humidity and it's going to feel like triple digits. Going to be a big impact day. Even Thursday with a few showers, perhaps a rumble of thunder. We're not quite done yet things get a little bit better as we head towards the weekend. In the meantime, we're enjoying 70s and 80s right now, but that low humidity is making it feel very nice this evening if you're going to be out. We'll time out when those storms get here hour by hour. Coming up in just a bit. Hey, Brett, thank you. A Detroit man has been charged with eight counts of arson in connection to a house fire that injured several firefighters when that home collapsed. Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy says 34-year-old Anthony Fields set the home on fire before running away. His attorney has entered a not guilty plea. We showed you the dramatic rescue on West Hollywood back on Thursday. Fields is due back in court next week. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, leading an official congressional delegation to Asia this week, arrives controversially in Taiwan. This marks the first official visit to Taiwan by a Speaker of the U.S. House in uh, 25 years. The visit comes despite harsh warnings from the Chinese government. A spokesman for the National Security Council says the Speaker has the right to visit Taiwan, and he's urging China to avoid further escalation.